presume that some of you will have celebrated Pancake Day last week. I thought that talking a bit about Pancake Day would be the perfect way to kick off this month's action on the subject of nutrition. But, more seriously, it's not just the pancakes, it's what they represent. Some of you from the Christian tradition may well have started off the season of Lent last week. For those who are a bit fuzzy about the concept of Lent, it's where you give up something, such as sugar, hence the pancakes, for the 40 days before Easter. Giving things up is something that we all try and do from time to time, whatever our tradition or cultural context. And it's not just Lent, just look at the Islamic month of Ramadan. Giving things up helps us think about how rich we really are and to think about the blessings that we have. And it also asks us to examine what it is that we really need and helps us think about what we might give up in order, in order to help others. It's part of being one human family and it certainly speaks to the motivations of many of us who take action on international development issues. I imagine that in any group of people like those of us on this call tonight, we've got a lot of similarities, but also quite a wide set of variations in the reasons why we're motivated to support international development. We often say that it's important to reflect on your own personal motivation from time to time, so that if you get the opportunity, you can tell people why you care about this work. As we know, there are a lot of people out there with very different sets of values who can potentially be united around the basic ideas of helping people get their basic needs met. So I often say, and you've probably heard me say it before, that no one wants to see children die un unnecessarily. And it results, we're fortunate to be able to work with politicians of all parties and all value sets to take forward our work on health, education and opportunities because of those core shared beliefs. But some people, particularly those who are attacking international aid in the press right now, are portraying us giving aid as giving something up, so that in giving it away, we no longer have it for ourselves. There are many things wrong with that simplistic analysis, but one of them is this. Most people have simply no idea how little we actually spend compared to our entire rich economy on aid. Most people don't understand how little impact at home our aid budget would make on some of the very expensive issues that we're currently dealing with. To put this into context, the UK's National Health Service budget alone is a similar size to all global aid put together from all countries. The next logical step is to understand that the good that this relatively modest giving does in the world is absolutely tremendous. And the benefits that flow back to the UK in soft ways like goodwill and moral leadership are increasingly being complemented by very measurable benefits such as the creation of trading partners or the establishment of global goods such as networks for disease outbreak surveillance or research and development for new drugs to combat drug resistant bacteria, then these can strike anywhere. To think of aid as taking and giving is missing the point completely. It is a creating. And increasingly, it's about creating a future together. This theme is something that we'll be addressing more and more uh, at results. And in fact, we'll be discussing it in a bit more depth at the National Conference in the first weekend in May, if I can put in a plug for that event. As countries get richer, and as we get close to meeting the global goals, countries start to become ineligible for support from donors like our own Department for International Development, or by some of the multilateral agencies that we at Results like to support, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, or the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, uh, TB and Malaria. We definitely do not want countries to remain dependent on aid, but they do need support in reaching their citizens with essential services such as healthcare, which involves working out how to develop their health systems. Building a health system is hard and can take decades. As we've seen in this country, it needs sustained political will, not only from its leaders, but also its citizens. If we're serious about seeing aid as a force for creating the future that we want with others, it's essential that the mix of domestic and international resources is very carefully managed. Just turning off the tap and hoping an aid recipient will cope by themselves leads to disaster, and we have seen this happen. Donors like Difford have the expertise to ensure that development in this new scenario is a partnership in which we stand together to ensure everyone has their basic needs met. But more importantly, as countries become richer, managing this shift from aid to a country's own resources becomes the norm for all countries, 
we cannot forget the other half of the equation. It's not just the money, it's also the people. Just as we hold our government to account, it's the citizens of those countries who will need to be able to monitor whether their governments are doing what they should be with their own resources. Are they spending enough on health? Are they reaching the poorest? Are they ensuring that none of their fellow citizens are left behind? We can hold our government to account for how we spend UK taxpayers' money and Kenyan, Ugandan, Indonesian and Indian citizens will be doing the same with their governments. That's at very much at the heart of the results model of people exercising their personal and political power to achieve change. We're going to be talking a lot more about this at our national conference in the first weekend in May. But right, before we go to this month's topic, I'm going to ask the grassroots team to help do a roundup of what's been happening around the UK as our contribution to global advocacy this month. Hi, can people hear me? It's Naveed here. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm trying to get on video, but I'm not appearing on screen by the looks of it. Never mind. Um, I can see you. You can? Oh, good. I can't see myself. But anyway, never mind. Um, so, um, I've lost my place now. Where am I going? So first of all, um, I just we've got had some more. Oh, there I am. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I've had we've had more updates um, on the January action, and so thanks to everyone who's still sending in um, updates. Um, for, this is for the MPs who've agreed to sign on uh, to a joint letter to Priti Patel, um, pushing for um, UK support for the polio eradication initiative. Since the last call, when we reported on the initial actions, we've had more sign-ons from. Um, politicians in Norwich, uh, London, Poole and Oxford, bringing the total results that we're, we're aware, aware of for, um, up to 14 letters sent, uh, 12 sign-ons from MPs across all parties and seven face-to-face -face meetings. So that's a really, really fantastic result um, from, from last month's action. Um, just to pick out one or two, um, we had a great email from Mark in the Norwich group. Um, they managed to uh, get um, Stuart Agnew, who is a UK, UKIP MEP from Great Yarmouth, uh, not only to sign on to the letter, but also to agree to become a polio champion. Um, and he said something like, this is exactly what we should be spending our aid money on. So um, just proving we can gain the support from people from all sorts of backgrounds and really big well done to Norwich for that one. Um, the Oxford group successfully met their, uh, their um, MP, Andrew Smith, who's a long-standing supporter of international development. And Deirdre from the Pool group met her MP, Michael Tomlinson. And that's in addition to all the things that we've already been told about and heard a bit about last month. So does anyone want to feed back on an, how any of those polio actions went or, or any actions on polio that we haven't um, already heard about? Uh, Deirdre Brock did get back in touch to say she was up, up for it. Sorry, Deirdre who Brock was who is this speaking? It's, it's Edinburgh, Edinburgh, and it was uh, Deirdre MP from uh, Edinburgh North said she was definitely keen to sign up to the letter. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Mark from Norwich here. Hi, Mark. Uh, uh, hiya. Uh, just to let everyone know, tomorrow, uh, if they look about uh, the Rotary Clubs around the, the UK, are doing a Purple for Polio uh, coffee mornings as part of uh, International Women's Week. And so if you see them popping up somewhere, and because they've, they've got these uh, purple uh, crocuses planted around the country in October, and the purple is to represent every time a child is vaccinated you put a purple mark on their fingernail so i think you if you put on social media there should be bits and pieces around the country purple for polio through the rotary clubs thanks mark um yeah it'd be good good to sort of see what what's going on there so that's purple for polio i think i googled it the other day and found it easily enough um anyone else on on, on the, any of the polio actions Okay, well thanks to everybody for those. Um, now on to TB. 
Um, several groups are busy organising their events on, world, on or around um, World TB Day on the 24th of March. Uh, we know of events planned in Brighton, Manchester, Oxford, Birmingham and Edinburgh. And we've heard about a mixture of film screenings, quizzes, exhibitions. So it looks like there's quite a few interesting ways of um, getting people's attention and starting conversations about antimicrobial resistance and um, drug resistant TB. Does anyone want to share any of those plans of things that are things that you've got coming up? Do you want to do your quiz then? What was that? What's happening with you? Yeah, go on. Go ahead, Carrie. <laughs> go on. Hello. Oh, it's Vicky. Hi. Vicky. Hello. Um, I, after the, um, you asked us to organise an event, I randomly got asked to run a quiz for a hockey club, which I do from time to time. Carbon Hockey Club. Carrie's Hockey Club, in fact, <laughs> randomly, but it was somebody else who asked me. And we're combining the two up, so I'm going to run the quiz. There's going to be one round will be stuff to do with TB and SDGs and things like that. And Carrie and the others are going to get people to do tweets and yeah. generally take photos of themselves with different boards and generally raise awareness in amongst the rest of the quiz, which is just for fun. So it's kind of a combination of things. Education and fun. And that's on March 17th. So I'll be able to tell all the group leaders about it at the away day then, or the day after. Fantastic. Thanks, Vicky. An anyone else? <laughs> Okay, well, best of luck to everybody who's got events planned or, or um, starting to shape up. Um, it's great to hear about some of those things that have been going on. And thanks, as always, for all of your hard work. Um, I should just also do an update on some of the events that we're planning from the office. So the first one is a, something we've mentioned already, um, the Advocacy Day in Westminster on Wednesday, the 27th of March. Um, these kind of advocacy days are a really great way to see the political system from the inside and really make an impact in the heart of our political establishment. So we're hoping that a number of you will be able to join us and um, engage with MPs on um, drug resistant t TB and, and say to them directly why it matters so much. Um, we're going to be able to pay people's travel to London, if that helps, uh, depending on how many are interested in that. So if you haven't already told me, please let me know by the end of this week, if possible, if you're interested in coming. Or even if you're not sure, just give me a, give me a bell. Uh, and we'll also be sharing social media uh, on the day, and so do keep a lookout for that. Um, and it's hashtag the drugs don't work. That's don't without an apostrophe. Um, Next, we're starting to get some exciting speakers lined up for our national conference, the 6th to the 8th of May, uh, which Aaron, Aaron's already plugged. Thank you, Aaron. Um, we've got a couple of speakers that we can announce now. One is someone called Sarah Corbett, who's the founder of an organisation called the Craftivist Collective. And she'll be uh, talking to us about how we can develop a positive attitude towards achieving change, uh, which is really good. Um, we'll also have a correspondent uh, from the New Statesman, Stephen Bush, who's going to be talking to us about how we can communicate with others about international development in a so-called post-truth world and with all the fake news like, uh, that's, that's flying around. Uh, we've also got a couple of politicians that we're hoping to have along as well, but that's not yet completely confirmed, so I won't give you names now. Uh, you can buy your tickets for £15 for the whole weekend or £10 for a one-day ticket. And you can do that by going to www.results.org.uk forward slash events and following the link to the national conference. We will post up more details of speakers and the agenda as, as, we, as it gets confirmed. And then just lastly, I would also like to plug the international conference in Washington, D.C. in uh, July. You can find details of that by going to the same page, the events page uh, under Get Involved. Um, and anyway, if you can attend there, you'll be able to meet up with activists from really all around the world who are calling on US politicians and officials um, to support the issues we work on. Um, we've had some people already express interest, and again, we have some travel bursaries, so please do get in touch if you want to know more. <coughs> That's it from me. So I'm going to go off the video and hand back to Aaron. Thanks, Naveed. Um, before I uh, do the next bit and introduce, introduce tonight's call, I just want to double check if we yet have our guest speaker on the call. Kate, are you on the call? I'm here. My video is just off till it's my turn. Oh, okay. Super. Great. Well, good. Um, so, look, thanks, thanks, Naveed. Thanks for joining us, Kate. Let me, let me do the introduction to the action. Um, so, many of the people on this call have been in 
previously involved in the Nutrition for Growth agenda since, since it was kicked off by Prime Minister David Cameron, uh, former Prime Minister David Cameron, back in 2013. As we're going to hear on tonight's call, despite this very welcome political leadership on nutrition, there are still far too many children who don't get an adequate start in life or who died before their fifth birthday because of a complication or infection that they could have fought off had they been properly nourished. Yet, as we will hear, only a tiny proportion of aid money and domestic spending in countries is aimed at tackling malnutrition. But before we go into the detail on this, I should say that it's been quite difficult, especially over the last year, for us to schedule campaign actions that have helped you guys to press the case for action on malnutrition. Um, there's some reasons for this. Differed and the current government is supportive, which means they haven't always needed our pushing on them in public, although we have continued to engage with them behind the scenes. The initial work that you guys did back in 2013 and have done since then has really stuck. But internationally, it's been hard to shape a strong international response and create new, a new moment where donors collectively step up to the plate and make strong new commitments. DFID have led the charge on this, working with other donors to create a roadmap that we're going to hear about later. As some of you will remember, back in August last year, we hoped that this moment would happen at the Rio Olympics. But for various reasons to do with the political situations in both Brazil and the UK, this couldn't happen. It's really important that we don't lose the momentum, and we're now going to hear what this looks like now that we're in 2017. So I am really delighted to introduce our expert speaker call, uh, on the call for this evening, Kate Gertzen. Hi, Kate. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Yeah, really great. Um, so welcome. Kate is a, a very experienced advocacy campaign lead uh, with a focus on creative, evidence-based messaging in global health. She is an active voice in global conversations on nutrition in both donor and high burden contexts and serves on the Scaling Up Nutrition Civil Society Steering Group. Now, for those of you who have ever been to the Results International Conference in Washington, DC, you may have met Kate as she's actually a, an alumni of the Global Results and Action family, having worked in our secretariat in DC on exactly this issue of nutrition, and she did a spectacular job there. So we are very pleased to have you back with us tonight, Kate. Thanks, Aaron. So you're on the regular monthly conference call with experienced and enthusiastic campaigners from all over the UK. You can hopefully see them on your screen. You can see the cities and towns that they're in. Um, this is a group of really uh, dedicated citizens, uh, campaigners, advocates, uh, some of whom have been doing this work for decades. Uh, they're passionate about this. The, they've worked on nutrition before. Most of them, not all of them, some of them are brand new. Um, and they're, they're really excited to get stuck in this evening. We've got two pre-prepared questions for you, and then we're going to open up the floor. Um, for those of you who are on your computers, you can let us know uh, that you want to ask a question using the chat function, which you should see on the left-hand side of the screen. Those of you who are on your phones can text in the way that you've done previously. Um, the number to text questions into, and you can send those anytime, is 0777561178. So that's 0777561178. So Kate, right before we go to the questions, can we ask you, say, just a couple of minutes to tell us your story? Um, what's your role in relation to advocacy on nutrition and how did you get involved? And most importantly, why does this matter to you? <laughs> Good questions. Um, I got involved in nutrition. It was kind of a surprise to me, actually, and then something I grew to be really passionate about when I learned more about it. But I was interested in joining results. I was interested in the shape of the organization and a role came open and um, a mentor I trusted said, hey, you should really talk to these guys. And so I, I actually joined for the, the way the organization works, the anti-poverty mission, um, the people I met, and then came to love working on nutrition. Um, and, and like Aaron said, I, I worked with uh, the Action Partnership based in DC, and, and then I moved on. I was the Director of Policy at 1000 Days, and now I'm working as a freelancer, um, as a consultant, 
focusing on the African Leaders for Nutrition, which may come up later. Um, and then I think you asked why I love doing it. Um, I think I didn't really understand before I started working on nutrition how many child deaths worldwide are, are due to this and, and just how solvable it is. Um, and and the, the resources for the going towards it, you know, from all sources are so low. Uh, so it seemed like the sort of thing where global networks were popping up quickly, really exciting conversations happening. Um, they were truly interactive and new um, in setting up the the ways we could work on this uh, all together. So that's why I love working on it. And I also love having the opportunity to work with grassroots. So thanks for having me from my dining room. <laughs> that's great. Thanks, Kate. Thank you so much for sharing all that, uh, that with us. Um, so I think we are going to go straight into the questions. Um, and if I am doing this right, the first question is going to come from Sheffield. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so first question is, so uh, why should the UK be spending more on tackling malnutrition when we keep hearing that the UK uh, is already a champion on nutrition? Yeah, good question. And something we've wrestled with in a lot of countries where government representatives say that, well, I'm doing a lot, you know, why should I dive in and give more? Um, I think the answer is partially just that they can, um, and also that we must do so much more collectively. So the UK, of course, has had, you know, a great track record of leadership um, with Nutrition for Growth, you know, all of these milestones that you're all quite aware of. But, uh, but the agenda has... I wouldn't call it dead in the water, but it's uh, <laughs> we have to find m moments to keep the momentum up or there's a risk of investments in nutrition falling off. And I think the UK has a political leadership role. Um, but what you're asking about is the money. You know, with 160 million children almost still stunted today, this is an emergency every day um, for families, for communities, for individual kids. Um, and it's the sort of emergency that, that doesn't wait until political tides change. Uh, we know that investment in the first thousand days between pregnancy and the second birthday is the most effective and is the time when we need to be reaching kids, we need to be reaching women who may choose to become pregnant um, with interventions that, that ensure good nutrition for both mother, child, and, and women for the sake of their own health. And that's really how we um, how we can prevent stunting, how we can prevent astronomical spending needed down the road. It's the sort of thing where you invest now because of the returns you know you'll see on the economic side and also because of the very human returns that you'll see in individual kids. I think when you boil it down to that child by child level, um, it starts to make more sense to people and, and the emergency of it starts, starts to feel more real. That's great, Kate, thanks. So that's fairly compelling. Um, so uh, I think we're gonna go to our second question from Edinburgh. I, I had to hold my tongue, I had to follow up myself, but we're gonna go to <laughs> Edinburgh for the second question. Hi, um, if nutrition is so important to saving lives and promoting economic development, why aren't donors and governments in countries with high malnutrition doing more? Um, so that, that question's a little tricky because they actually are doing quite a bit and uh, there's movement towards them doing a lot more. So one of the things I'm working on is called the African Leaders for Nutrition and it's a new heads of state initiative launched by the African Development Bank. Um, so will become public in in May and voted on by the AU in July. So that'll be in the news to help dispel that myth. I would also say that in a lot of countries, domestic spending is actually a lot higher um, as a percentage than donor and uh, both bilateral and multilateral spending on nutrition. Um, and then the last thing is 
when you're looking at tiny amounts in either case, does it really matter? You know, is there any purpose in comparing those two amounts or is it more useful to say, you know, there's so much more left to do, what are we waiting for? Um, and wouldn't it be more impactful if the country level we were looking across, for example, reproductive, maternal and child health or um, early years, you know, pre-primary education, care and nurture, training for parents, along with nutrition? How can we make the money that's already in the pipeline more effective and more impactful? Um, I think that was your whole question, but, but let me know if there's more there I didn't address. <laughs> no, that's great, thank you. Thanks. And then the last of the pre-prepared questions uh, is gonna come from Norwich. We have <laughs> Norwich. Hi Kate, it's Anne-Marie in Norwich. Um, we are asking the UK government to increase its spending on nutrition, but we know that resources will be limited to increase the impact of what we already have on the existing resources. Yeah, um, that's also really important. So I think part of it I alluded to in my last answer, um, where it's really important to work across sectors to understand that nutrition is one of those areas like many in development, but especially so for nutrition, where um, you have to work across sectors to see the maximum impact. Um, you have to encourage partnerships within countries and coordination between bilateral donors to, um, to make sure that money's going where it's needed the most. That said, we also have a really clear idea of which interventions, what kind of work for nutrition has the highest impact. Um, I talked about the first thousand days we also know that there's a set of interventions that we could roll out tomorrow. And it's my opinion that that's where, where our immediate fund should be going. And then there's a set of inter interventions that are needed that we're waiting on guidance from the World Health Organization. So, um, so I think focusing our money on where we know it can make an impact immediately um, is really important. Thanks, Kate. Mm -hmm. Aaron, are you on mute? Aaron, you're muted. <laughs> Bear with us while we, we, we get our chair back. <laughs> um, yes, this is uh, Lynn Lisko. Um, Go ahead, William. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your. Uh, input, Kate. Um, I'm just uh, worried about the famine situation in central, across the central belt of um, Africa at the moment. Uh, you haven't mentioned that and uh, must be a huge uh, concern for your uh, setup. Yes, um, so food insecurity is obviously a, a big part of what um, those of us doing advocacy on nutrition are concerned about, especially in cases of emergency, um, whether it's conflict or you know, a natural disaster. Um, I think getting food aid, though it's not the same as nutrition, but linked into those areas is, is very important, obviously, and actually a key component that um, many people don't think about is supporting breastfeeding, actually, in, in refugee settlements um, as a way to keep very little babies um, from dying from malnutrition while they're trying to escape from conflict. And then I think the other piece to keep in mind is that, um, you know, we don't always know when emergency will strike and when there will be migrant or refugee issues, but what will always be true is that nutrition is appropriate and needed for every child. And if you have strong programs in place, um, those systems for providing those services will be more resilient 
um, when conflict does strike. So I think there's, there's something to be said, obviously, for going in very quickly in, in times of crisis. Um, that's extremely appropriate. And honestly, there's a huge need they're not fulfilled, but also um, making sure there are support systems in place, making sure kids are already benefiting from good nutrition um, as a part of day-to-day -day life so that they'll be less at risk if, if there should be an interruption in their normal routine, you know, whether it's a, a short illness or a protracted condition, like actually having to migrate to a different place. Um, so I think there's that, that food security element to keep in mind, but also the finding, you know, the, the baseline human right of health uh, through nutrition. Thank you very much. Hi, this is oh. Peter or Jill. Hi, I was going to ask a question as well. We did it at the same time. Okay, you go first, Jill. You're the lady. Okay. <laughs> Right, we're we're asking. Um, oh, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not a myth. We're asking for better, greater, and better resources and programs. We're asking um, Mr. Tell for that. What sort of thing? Can you give us some examples of the sort of things that we're asking the government for? Greater and better resources. What would that look in actual smart targets? So what would a family experience in real life, like put, put a face on it? Um, no, I mean, we're asking her for more resources and programs. Can we just give, an, give some examples of that, the sort of programs that we'd be asking the UK government to commit to? So I think um, linking back to the evidence we have, uh, she should be familiar with the Lancet issue from 2013, which is all about nutrition um, and has the, the list of the, you know, evidence-based and co most cost-effective interventions. Um, and then in a practical sense, you know, I expect that you're asking any new commitment to be smart. Mm -hmm. um, and I see you immediately nod your head, so you must also know the <laughs> acronym. Yeah. Um, but what is it? Sustainable, measurable, accountable, achievable. Achieve oh, I like it's accountable time frame. too. <laughs> time time bound. Frame. <laughs> All of these good words that are that are easy to forget when you're when you're working on a political maneuver, but are so key for accountability. And I think the UK, the more specific Ms. Patel can be in her commitment um, for DFID. The, the more of a kind of legitimate leader on this effort um, that she'll be able to be. And I know that she is now serving as a part of the Scaling Up Nutrition Lead Group, which is kind of like a board structure for the Sun Movement. Um, so sh she'll also be influenced from that side um, and be regularly talking to people like African Development Bank President Adesina, um, people from civil society programs who can give examples. I, I thought that was a really lovely development that she'll be serving on that. Okay, thank you. So it's Aaron here. I'm, I'm back. Uh, technology problems. I do not know what happened to Gremlins Scott. And um, what I was trying to read out was a question from Poole. Um, so uh, I, I don't think it would have been asked because it wasn't quite long enough. Uh, but if it has, please forgive me. Um, the question from Paul read, um, Kate, could you outline this kind of practical opportunities to link some of these different nutrition uh, or other uh, activities that Results works on together? For example, giving vitamin A supplementation at the same time as going around and delivering polio vaccination. Can you talk a little bit about that kind of thing? Yeah, so I can give a couple examples of integrated programs. Um, both of which feel so simple now that I'm aware of them, but I might not have thought of myself. Um, so the first, uh, I visited with a group of other resultser, resultsers just outside of Cape Town, South Africa, um, in a settlement ca called Kailicha. Um, and this is a, a settlement of, of millions of, of people and you know thousands of families. Um, and so the program's innovation was to have uh, mothers who had 
children of their own who um, had had good health and nutrition serve as mentors uh, to moms who who were pregnant and who had young children. And so they had a very simple chart, uh, which is just a growth chart where it shows over time how tall the kids should be. And is, this is a you know a, a very common thing for use in basically every medical facility where they're working on nutrition in every country. But what they had done was integrate into the same timeline when vaccines should be received um, and where they could go, and also who to talk to at each of the milestones if they needed some encouragement or words of advice. Um, so that was a, a very practical example of uh, integrating care for, for mom, kids, and, and, the, and the rest of the family in some ways by going to the families. Um, another program I visited just outside of Nairobi last year um, found they were actually identifying HIV cases primarily among adults when they were doing house visits um, about early childhood development, including nutrition. Um, so basically they would send their volunteers into the community to check up on the young kids who they knew were living uh, nearby and would end up providing health for the whole family. And because it was the district hospital, this is something they could do. Um, but if they had been a much smaller organization, they might have had to get creative about, about working with others who, who were equipped to um, bring those individuals living with HIV into care. Um, so those are two interesting examples. Uh, the third one that I learned about just a few weeks ago um, is a World Bank project on pre-primary education. So education for kids three to five years old before kindergarten, um, where they were also doing nutrition monitoring and also sometimes in the evenings, educating parents about the, the naturally occurring plants in their communities, in their gardens that they could cook into nutritious food. So some element of community education that you know, hopefully led to better nutrition outcomes um, for the families reached uh, just because their kids were going to school. Um, Aaron, we had a question from uh, Pete whilst you were offline. Pete, do you still have your question? Yes, I do. Um, earlier, earlier, Kate, you were talking about things that um, you would like to see implemented like immediately. Uh, and I, I, I know you've mentioned a few so far, but if you could extend your list a bit, things that would work like right now. Yeah. Um, so the biggest one is encouraging and enabling women to breastfeed if they would like to and making that um, about a woman's choice to do that rather than her circumstance. Uh, and that would save, I think, 800,000 lives before 2025, but I can follow up with the infographic if that would be helpful. Um, so that's the biggest one, including in emergencies we're actually providing that safe space to care for toddlers and to breastfeed in some ways gives some, you know, political and health agency back to women. So it has that um, really nice knock on effect because they're able to make more decisions about um, their own well being. Uh, vitamin A injections for young infants is something we've known how to do for a long time that has approved guidance on how to roll it out at population scale. Um, trying to think what else. Uh, having skilled medical professionals um, available when a woman is giving birth is extremely impactful in saving both her life and the life of her baby. Um, everyone's first day of life is their most dangerous. Uh, so, so just having a trained medical professional, even if it's, um, you know, it doesn't have to be like a fancy, <laughs> fancy doctor, someone who is at least a trained midwife and can understand what a woman is going through can, can save a lot of lives. And that, that actually is the most effective midwifery. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. Treatment for acute malnutrition. 
So kids who have, are, are wasted because they aren't getting enough food. So the difference between enough food and enough nutrients. Kids who are wasted are not getting enough food. That's the stereotypical picture of a child that is skin and bones or might have a um, swollen belly. In what sense, uh, sorry to interrupt, but the last two you mentioned, which is the skilled medical pros and the acute malnutrition, in what sense do you advocate action on the part of donors and, ad and advocates? Because it sounds like that, yeah, they sound like they're needed, but I got the sense that you were talking about things that we could do. So in what sense can we do, can we deal with providing more medical pros at childbirth and um, address acute malnutrition globally? Mm -hmm. So I think those are certainly things donors can be a part of, especially if their um, development assistance is linked to national level strategies. So we ask countries, um, and this is just a great idea regardless, to have a costed strategy for re reaching the nutrition targets. Um, so whether it's uh, raising breastfeeding up to a specific percentage or making sure um, a certain percentage of wasting cases are treated every year so they can't proceed further and become severe acute malnutrition, which is deadly. Um, I think looking to the country and, and co-developing a strategy for, for reaching the targets by working across sectors is really important. So having skilled medical professionals may not sound like nutrition immediately, um, but it actually does have tangible, large impacts on the nutritional status of a child later in life, whether there was medical staff there um, when he or she arrived. And part of that's just because, you know, uh, not dying in, during childbirth is everyone's, is, is our goal to keep as many babies alive as possible, but it's also that breastfeeding is encouraged. So I think understanding the linkages um, across areas that people might not think are, are um, actually impactful on one another is part of it and then looking to countries for guidance on where they actually have the gaps and how they would spend any new funds. So you're talking about um, setting up agreements with recipient countries that are conditional on providing feedback on more uh, breastfeeding, better breastfeeding, more professionals at childbirth and better nutrition for children. Is that, is that what you're saying? Um, yeah, I mean, a, a good example of that is the idea of results-based financing, where if a country sees success in a specific program, um, not just in outputs, but in outcomes for actual communities, that they can apply and receive kind of bonus funds under more concessional terms. Um, so there are incentives that, that donors can do to say, actually this would align really well with our strategy and it would look to the successes you've already had. But I think regardless, looking at what a country would like to do next, drawing on their own experience um, is, is the way that I like to see it work. Can I, can I jump in here, Pete, and give you a concrete example from something I saw um, when I was in uh, Zambia last year or the year before? It was actually a differed run program where they had set up a training center for young men and women to become community health workers. Uh, and so what they were doing was, you know, we met this amazing young guy, super well-dressed, um, uh, you know, who was wearing his Sunday best clothes to meet us. And his job uh, was to go around to visit every single house in his entire uh, area. He said some days he would, sometimes he would walk for a couple of days to visit some of these houses that were so far oh. away. And when he visited, he did a whole pile of things, including, you know, checking nutritional status uh, of the children and of the family um, and, and tying in some of these other complementary interventions and so on. And what was really interesting about that program was that, you know, first of all, this was a pretty cool young, young man that we met, very committed, um, very focused on outcomes for his community. He was from that community. He'd been trained by Diffid and supported by Diffid with the first couple of years of his salary, 
but the, the, the project was set up so that the Zambian government was taking over the payroll uh, and the ongoing support for his whole cohort uh, uh, of colleagues. Um, it's those kinds of things where you're looking at asking donors to support countries' plans and to help them build out uh, the things that are going to work for them um, and, and getting these, these outcomes that can be quite uh, exciting on a, a sort of practical level. And that, that's something I, I, saw, I saw myself. Wow, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, Aaron, it's Naveed here. Uh, we've got a question in from um, Nor Norwich. I'm, I'm not sure you've, you're able to see it on, on your screen. I know you've been having some technical problems. Um, it sounds like a simple question. It may not be. How does the availability of clean water supplies tie into nutrition programs? So, uh, Kate, are you able to take that one? Yes. Um, we could spend all day talking about that. Um, <laughs> So, so water and sanitation, effectively known as WASH, is one of the areas the most closely tied to nutrition. And yet we haven't done a great job of actually linking them. Um, I would say more so on the donor side. Uh, there's been more success in doing it on, on country level programs. Um, so a really good example of this is we, I think probably everyone on the call knows very well the statistic that about half of all child deaths are due to malnutrition. Um, and it seems so high, you know, how could it be? Uh, actually, quite a few of those are due to um, diarrhea because of unsafe water um, and because of uh, underdeveloped sanitation systems. So a child becomes malnourished because they're suffering from not being able to keep enough nutrients in the body that child uh, may become wasted. And then the, the cruel catch-22 is that once you are wasted, it's actually harder for you to absorb more nutrients when they are available to you. And then of course, also harder to fight off um, illness. So pneumonia is then the next bit of the deaths that are really traced back to malnutrition, something I certainly didn't know um, back when I was working on HIV. <laughs> uh, so I couldn't say enough actually about the, the linkages to WASH. Um, it really differs in each country uh, kind of how the approach has worked in India because it's transitioned to middle income and because there are so many people in many parts of the country, um, the water and sanitation is a challenge. And for that reason, the types of malnutrition you see tend to be more acute malnutrition um, compared to elsewhere that, that either has fewer um, infrastructure strains or, um, or, or where it was easier to roll out a solution because you're talking about fewer communities in total. Um, so India actually has some interesting examples of, of kind of bridging that and, and figuring out how to, to, to make sure that even as those systems are improved that people are able to stay healthy the one other thing I would mention that I hadn't thought of before until um, last year when I was learning about more about early childhood development and nutrition in emergencies is that formula, um, when it comes as a powder, is often mixed with water. Um, and if you don't have a safe water source, you, will, you may accidentally give an infant um, something that will make them sick when, when you think you're giving them nutrients. So it's another reason to support breastfeeding, to remove that decision from the calculus and to make that a mistake that someone can't accidentally make. Um, and then that challenge carries over into emergencies as well, where you might have had strong water and sanitation infrastructure before, but we'll have to um, you know, purposefully build it anew if, if you're going to have it. So another reason to, to enable breastfeeding both as a part of everyday life, as a choice that women can make to um, prevent stunting and then in emergencies, when it doesn't seem like it would be an emergency, but it actually is to, to keep those kids alive. Wonderfully comprehensive answer for the time <laughs> that we have. Um, we have about five or six minutes left for further questions. I haven't received any via 
uh, text message. Uh, I am uh, unable to see if you type them into the screen, but maybe if you have one you want to yell out, um, please go ahead. Could I have one more, please? <laughs> go ahead, William. <laughs> um, there was the mention in the notes about the part that agriculture uh, could play. Uh, can you say a little about that? Uh, we, in results, have uh, um, heard quite a bit about uh, the, the large um, farmer, uh, poor farmers, and uh, perhaps um, your answer will impinge on that subject. Sure. Um, so I'm not an agriculture expert, but and that's my disclaimer. But um, I know that uh, an ag system and a healthcare system in countries um, they often see growth kind of in parallel because uh, because of the incomes of individual farmers links back to the the health of their families and their communities. I think as bigger corporations, and this is my opinion, <laughs> um, take over farming in countries, you have to be careful that they are still looking out for the nutrition of the communities where, where their farms are and of the whole country. Um, and then more broadly, and apologies, I don't have a deeper background on this, this area. Uh, I think as countries become richer, um, sometimes agriculture falls to the wayside as an industry, and you see people eating more processed foods. Um, this is why obesity rates often rise as economies grow. And so um, in a lot of places, you see then the double burden of malnutrition with obesity and underweight and stunting all in the same place. Um, so, that is the extent of my, my personal agriculture knowledge, but um, certainly on the emergency side, on the infrastructure side, on the, the issue of making sure there are good jobs at the community level, um, really important, and for food security. Can you press, can you press researchers to uh, uh, focus on the nutrition value of uh, crops and Yes. So, so there is um, technology to fortify seeds so that crops are more nutritious, and that's very important. Thank you for reminding me of that. It's called biofortification. And then I think finding ways to incentivize, you know, crops that aren't um, all starch and perhaps have some vitamins in them would be good as well. But the biofortification is extremely important and something you saw me just forget about. We, we forget about that all the time when we're so used to it in the US, in the UK, um, having things like flour even have vitamins already in it, sugar already have vitamins in it. Those are not a given and, and programs we can encourage to, to get more vitamins into every family's diet without them having to think about it. Thanks for that reminder. And, and I think that's really right, Kate. And then one thing I will say also is that this is where the, the definition of nutrition sensitive versus nutrition specific um, really becomes important. And I think, you know, it's, it's kind of a technical term, but quite often you hear uh, people talking about nutrition sensitive agriculture in our sector. And what, what that basically means is that you can run an agricultural program that generates vast amounts of food, uh, but doesn't actually do all that much for nutrition. Um, because it's the kind of food, like, like Kate was saying, that's just all starches and it doesn't have any like proper nutritional content. And so I think here, you know, there's a, there's a very, very common misconception um, that people hold that I held until I started doing this work, which is that nutrition is just about growing more food. And, it's, and so if you get agriculture right and the agriculture is going well, the nutrition will just go away. And it really isn't that, 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 that case at all. If you want a good agricultural investment to have meaningful impact on nutritional outcomes for actual people, and particularly poor people in places where the agriculture is happening, you have to be deliberate about it. You have to structure your intervention in a way so that people don't get left behind, so that the food that's being grown is nutritious and it's available to people. A really easy mistake to make. Uh, I, I made it when I started looking at this work. Um, not so long ago. 
Aaron, we've got a, a question for Kate that's been typed into the chat function. Have we got time for that? Yeah, I think that might have to be the last one, though, David. Okay, so this is from Sheffield. Uh, what are the barriers you've come up against when trying to implement projects, political or cultural? Hmm. Um, good question. I think uh, cultural can be a challenge if a project is understood as coming from outside the community. Um, so the solution there is to make sure it doesn't. <laughs> um, but a really good real life example in which I won't name, name names, but this is true, is a company about a decade ago, I think, who decided that they could make um, more effective water pumps uh, or water pumps that would kind of pump themselves and women, women wouldn't have to stand there all day moving the lever if it was attached to a merry-go-round for children. Um, it's not a terrible idea, but they didn't talk to the community about what they wanted and, and they didn't implement with local partners. And so it turns out the kids didn't want to play on it and now women have to walk in a circle to get their water. I mean, hopefully it's been fixed, but that was the immediate impact. Um, so I think that's just one example of a really well-meaning project that was meant to solve a very real gap where um, the community wasn't brought in in the way that was needed to make it effective. So I personally have not witnessed um, political or cultural barriers to getting nutrition programs implemented. I think there's uh, a challenge to helping people understand the difference between having enough food and having the right foods. I think when you have priorities or you're living in emergencies, um, sometimes it's hard to to make that distinction and then that's just human, you know? Um, but m making it easier for families to, to have a bunch of choices in front of them, whether it's um, making sure fortified grains cost even a penny less at the store, makes people buy them. Um, making sure sugar, if people choose to eat it, has uh, vitamin A and vitamin C in it, which I will tell you has been true at every hotel in Zambia where I've ordered myself a coffee, the sugar is full of vitamins, you know, making those sorts of things automatic um, and making sure they're culturally appropriate, making sure you're working within communities to, to make sure a response is sustainable um, is really important. But I, I don't have any kind of uh, stories about nutrition programs not working out in, in in the same way that that one example was. I think it's more about uh, explaining to people the difference between hunger and nutrition and malnutrition, explaining the really straightforward solutions and explaining the really straightforward immediate impacts of investing more and the fact that kids can't wait. Thanks, Kate. That is a wonderful way for us to finish up uh, this part of the evening, Kids Can't Wait. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you um, for, to everybody on the call for your very thoughtful questions and Kate for your uh, very, very, um, you know, comprehensive and, and incredibly intelligent answers um, and, and for joining us from the States and for sharing all of your passion and expertise. So uh, thanks very much, Kate. You're welcome. This was fun. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so... Right before we go, uh, I'm, I'd just like to mention that tomorrow is International Women's Day. So Yay. please, hooray. Um, so please do go to the results website and social media and share whatever you find there uh, or for any, from any other development agencies. Um, all about the importance of help working to help women and girls who are disproportionately affected by poverty. Uh, which hopefully is not news to anybody on this call. But a few quick statistics. Um, 130 million girls did not go to school today who should have done. Uh, if all women completed primary education, the number of mothers dying in childbirth would reduce by two thirds. And one additional year of schooling would result in an almost 12% increase in women's wages. These inequalities and almost any other you can find for almost any other development outcome uh, are simply not acceptable. So as we fight to achieve the global goals, let's focus on the needs of women and girls and the incredible opportunities that will be unlocked if we do so. 
These examples are shared on the importance of girls' education in particular, which we'll be campaigning on very shortly, so really clearly why this matters. So lastly, thank you again to everyone for joining us tonight. Enjoy the rest of your evenings and do get into action. Thank you so much for working with us. Well. Have a good evening. And you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Aaron. Bye. 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 Bye